Hello everybody, really, really warm welcome to today's webinar, which is Exercise and MS, what you need to do, why, and really importantly, how to do it. So our wonderful presenter today is Eric Morales. I'd like to start our programs with an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, MS Limited acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Eric Morales, our presenter today. So Eric is an exercise physiologist at MS. He's based in Lidcombe in Sydney at the MS Centre there. And he's been with MS for four years. So he's every day in the gym helping people to uh, get exercising and uh, improve their, their well-being. Um, so outside of work, Eric is um, obviously active. He loves traveling and skiing. And through exercise, it's Eric's um, hope to empower and equip his clients with a neurological condition, with the skills and ambitions and drive to reach their full potential and live their best life. And Eric and I have been talking a lot about exercise and what get, gets in the way of exercise and how we can um, find ways to get movement in, in our lives. And so I'm really, really looking forward to uh, Eric's presentation. So yes, thanks Nicola. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And I guess just very briefly before we go into this slide, just to, I guess, um, build on what, what Nicola, you were saying. Um, first of all, I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing today all things exercise and I guess taking a different approach to exercise as well. Um, so like Nicola said, I've been here at MSL since 2018. And in that time, I've been able to work with a range of amazing clients and I guess one thing that really stand out, stands out for me is the level of resilience that all clients show. And so I guess for me, being from the outside in, um, it's just very inspiring to see. So yeah, I guess that's why I love my job and that's why I'm really passionate to promote exercise and help clients live the best life that they can. Um, so I guess if there's one thing I've come to conclude with exercise, it's that for all clients I see here at the clinic, exercise isn't just about getting stronger, it's not about getting fitter, but it has a deeper meaning than that to a lot of people. And I guess that's what I want to explore and uncover today. Exercise doesn't have to be an obstacle or a hassle, but instead it can be really empowering. It can be fulfilling and actually enable you to live the best life that you can. So with that in mind, uh, throughout my presentation, I want you to, to think about why, why do you exercise or why can, what, what's gonna get you to exercise, I guess. So I guess I'm really hopeful that I'm able to, to plant a seed to inspire a lot of people to maybe not straight away, but I guess even being more conscious of it and being more conscious about their exercise and movement goals. So just briefly, I won't go into, into this too much, but I think it's important to touch. So what I'll say is that the role in AP, of AP can sometimes be undervalued or in some cases not even tr really known about. So I guess in a nutshell, if I was to, if someone was to ask me what an AP does, and simply put, an AP's role is to design, deliver and evaluate and exercise intervention that's suitable to the client's goals and needs. And so just like you can access your physio, OT or psychologist through your NDIS plan, you can do the same with your EP services. So, but if once again, if you're not part of the NDIS scheme, there are also other avenues via one's aged care package, perhaps uh, GP referral, or you can also get in contact with your EP and I'm sure they'll be able to advise on the best avenue that um, works for you. So over the next few slides, let's talk about exercise, right? That's why everyone's here. But let's talk about the body as well and why an EP should be part of that allied health team or your. So really the aim 
today is not so much to focus on the benefits of exercise and have the usual exercise presentation talking about the benefits of exercise. But really, I want to take a different approach and talk about why. Why is movement and regular exercise so important for the human body in general? Why does MS affect the body? And why do people with MS find it difficult to participate in regular exercise and then ways to overcome this? So I guess if we have a good understanding of the why, then it really opens a, a lot of doors for us and allows us to explore these topics with a much greater level of detail and understanding. So let's get into it. So I want to discuss exercise and the importance of movement from a different perspective and perhaps one we haven't considered. So I'm sure we've all, we're all aware of the benefits of exercise physical health, mental health, uh, social aspect. But I want to take a different approach. And so we know movement and exercise is good for us, but why, why did this come to be? So despite decades of research and countless health campaigns, we continue to be faced by an ever increasing global health pandemic that um, has no end in sight. So for example, what I mean, what I mean by that is Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally, with an estimated 18 million lives lost each year, which represents 32% of all deaths globally. And this is according to the World Health Organization statistics. So what that means is that a third of all deaths are due to cardiovascular disease, which in part can be prevented through lifestyle factor factors such as uh, tobacco use, uh, obesity, diet, and physical activity. And so just for reference, cardiovascular disease is, I guess, a group of conditions that affects the heart and blood vessels. Um, and this being things such as stroke or coronary heart disease as well. So WHO, the World Health Organization, but I'll be referring it to WHO for short, reported that in 2018, a quarter of the world population did not meet physical activity guidelines. So at that time, that equated to about 2 billion people worldwide not meeting the recommended dosage of exercise. And so closer to home, the numbers are frankly quite worse, more worse. So um, a 2021 report by the federal government reported that 55% of adults did not meet the physical activity guidelines and 85% did not meet the physical activity and the strengthening guidelines as well. And really, if anything, these numbers are just increasing. And the other thing that was interesting to note um, when I was doing some research and looking into the World Health Organization statistics was that they reported the global rate of physical activity levels didn't, imp didn't improve since 2001. So what does this tell us? So I guess the numbers show that clearly we have a global health crisis and it's not getting better, but if anything, getting worse, right? But the other thing that this tells us is that the numbers show that health promotion strategies from an international national level have so far failed, really. The numbers show that as a society, we need to do much better. And the good thing is that we can do better. But the numbers only show part of the story, really. They don't, they don't explain why. They don't tell us about the many obstacles that we all face. And they don't tell us about the many obstacles people with a neurological condition like MS face as well. And so I'm sure everyone tuning in at home, you will know much better than I do the many obstacles and barriers that people with MS face on a daily basis. So I guess what I want to get from today is this, let's work together. Let's let's come up with some ideas together, maybe even, and let's come up with a plan that works for you as well. So I guess I want to, in doing that, I want to give some insight and I guess provide some guidance. And I think the best way to do with that is to come from a different perspective, right? 
because the numbers show that traditional health promotion strategies are simply failing us, yeah. And I think that the best way to do that is to explain why. What, because like I said, if we can understand the why, then it unlocks so much more knowledge. And I think with everything, that's the key. Knowledge is the key in so many instances. So I'll be, let's begin by explaining why the human body requires regular movement, but we'll do so from a different perspective. We'll do so from an evol evolutionary perspective and something perhaps hasn't been discussed and isn't the traditional method of discussing the benefits or the role that exercise and movement has. So, there's, there was this really interesting article. There was a really interesting journal article that was written by Luberman from Harvard University in 2015. And it draws a really fascinating take on humans and movement. So I wanna break this article down a bit. And so to do so, let's travel back in time. Let's travel millions of years ago, right? Let's go to a place where everything you can imagine in today's world is gone right from transportation to the technology we all have all grown so used to all gone um, so i guess in doing that we see that our ancestors millions of years ago movement was essential it was necessary for the survival of the human species it was essential for hunting uh, for food and supplies or even more important, movement was essential to evade predators and enemies, right? And so when I was reading this article, it the it what it reported and what it mentioned was that the stone tipped spear was invented about five hundred thousand years ago. So that means that it's estimated for nearly two million years, the main method of hunting was through pure persistence and physical exertion to get that done. And so the human body adapted to this. We evolved to outrun and eventually kill our prey to survive. So I guess put simply, humans evolved to be very well adapted to regular amounts of physical activity. The human body evolved to cope with the demands imposed on it and it never really evolved with the long-term effects of inactivity. It never really considered this. And so I guess that's why non-infectious conditions such as heart disease, osteoporosis, type two diabetes have become so much more common in today's world. The human structure from an anatomical perspective, so think uh, your bones and ligaments, but also from a physiological perspective. So think uh, your brain and the heart. They all, one thing that they all have in common is that they require load and movement to operate at optimal levels. For you see that humans never evolved to be almost um, physically inactive. We evolved to be very active indeed, and we evolved to be absolutely fascinating and extremely complex machines that require regular movement to thrive and survive. So let's, just, let's fast forward to the present day now. Food and groceries delivered straight to our door, transportation making it easier to transit long distances with close to no physical exertion needed, machines doing labor that previously humans would, the internet bring everything we need straight to our phones, the advance, advancement of medicine and technology as, well, technology as well. So it's clear that we've taken huge strides to better the world. And, you know, with all this added convenience and benefits, some, something has to give, right? So I guess the question then becomes, what are the negatives to this? Because with, with all the positives, there are some negatives, right? And so I guess the end product of this is less physical exertion, less movement and reduced demands imposed on the human body, just simply because it's not necessary. It's not as necessary as it was. Now, in saying this, it doesn't mean that 
humans didn't adapt to rest, to not rest and recoup their energy. The only difference is now we live in a period of time where we don't have to physically exert ourselves throughout the day. It's not necessary to survive as it was and as as he, as, as we were made to overhaul. So I read that hunter-gatherers millions of years ago who were physically active for four to six hours of their day, four to six hours, are still two times more active than most people in post-industrial econo economies, so today's world. So something has to give, right? We have to compensate for this reduced physical demands that have been imposed on us, not, not sometimes not even through our own um, ability, but also the environment around us with technology, transportation. And so I guess how we compensate through this is that we have to then increase the exercise or the regular movement of the human body. And so one really interesting point that Lubeman noted in the article was that in today's world, we have created technologies and support systems to effectively treat and cope with symptoms of these conditions, like type 2 diabetes, for example, which is absolutely incredible, right? And I think that's something that we have to and we will continue to work towards and get better at. But what he did note was that we have to break this cycle of it being symptoms, treatment and management and that being the cycle and instead promoting a more preventative measure to stop this cycle from occurring in the first place. So I guess from an evol evolutionary perspective uh, we can begin to understand why regular exercise and movement is so important and why a lack of physical inactivity is so detrimental to the human body. And in saying all this though, the other thing to really note is that exercise doesn't always guarantee us good health. And it's not the only answer either. It's just simply a very important piece to the puzzle, a very important piece to the toolkit and a very important piece to optimal human function. So I guess why I say this is because we just we weren't adapted to be physically active, but we're also adaptive to be physically inactive where, where, wherever possible. It's absolutely natural, normal to rest. And that's why sleep is absolutely crucial. But I don't think that humans millions of years ago wanted to go out hunting for kilometers and put themselves through the high level of physical exertion and risk, but it was necessary. So in actual fact, and I guess to summarize, we're not so different from our ancestors all those millions of years ago. Like them, we only exercise and move when it's necessary and when it's fun to do so. And so, I, and so what I took away from the article is that that's the key, making movement necessary, or if not, making exercise fun or a combination of both. Because if anything, evolution has taught us that these are the two factors that lead to movement. It's it being necessary and it's it being fun or both. So I guess the next question is, what does that mean, right? So it means two things. One, um, what we have to do is we have to find ways to make exercise and physical activity fun and enjoyable whether it be at schools, workplaces, and even at home, okay? And then two, we need to restore the necessity to move in our environment. And so until we do these two, two things very well, we can expect the same vicious cycle of inactivity and global health crisis we find ourselves in. So the pick, I guess the next question becomes how? How can we do this? And Simple, I guess it's a simple question, but I guess it's a, also a very complex answer because it doesn't only involve you, it involves society as a whole. But I guess in regards to what you can do, you, you can, I guess, begin to be more conscious of your movement, 
implement regular movement snacks, as I like to call them. Have fun with it and make it necessary. We'll get into how we can do this through an exercise program later in the slides as well. So the four pillars of brain health. Um, I guess they outline some of the key components that lead to optimal brain health. And so we know that this is important for two main reasons. One, because the brain is king. So think, the, think of the brain like a, uh, like a supercomputer that's constantly receiving and sending information to different muscles, organs, and um, th I, I guess another way to think of it is, is like a, a highway of information that allows us to interact and respond to the environment around us. And I guess the other reason is because when we consider MS, multiple sclerosis, MS, it's a neurological condition, right? And so what that means is that it affects the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And so to better manage MS and our health in general, we need to make sure that we're looking after our brain health. And so I, I guess another way to, to think of it is imagine the brain like a concrete slab of your home, the foundation of your home. And so if you don't have a if you don't set a good foundation, then everything that's built on top of it will just begin to fail, it will falter, and um, eventually it will come crumbling down. And much is the same with the brain. So if you failure to look after the brain, your brain health, and your movement, mood, and interaction with the world around you will become compromised as a result. So one, we know sleep is absolutely essential. And as I touched on before, we didn't only evolve to be physically active all the time, but we also evolved to require rest and sleep. And so the reason is because rest and sleep allows the body to repair and maintain the human body. So clearly sleep is very important. So, I mean, I guess in, in regards to the general tips, right, when it comes to sleep, it, I guess the general theme is that it comes down to setting an optimal environment where you can begin to unwind and set a good tone to, for a good sleep. This might include um, setting a nighttime routine, minimizing artificial light, keeping a cool, cool environment, a cool room. Um, but the other thing to consider is that in some instances, like with a mess, there's other uh, symptoms which can hinder or impact your sleep. So stress, psychological impact, muscle spasms keeping you up at night, or maybe it's bladder issues breaking up your sleep. So what I'd recommend in this case is two things. One, still consider, you know, setting up a nighttime routine that will help you unwind later in the day, but also focus and target those neuro symptoms that might be affecting your sleep, such as those muscle spasms or bladder issues. The other thing, social interaction, point number two here. Uh, I, I guess when it comes to social interaction, it's important for our mental health and it's important for the stimulus of the brain. And the reason is because the brain thrives on new stimulus. It, it, it loves and it requires challenging and demanding tasks. And if anything, I think over the past couple of years, right, we can all, all agree that what, what this has taught us is that the importance of staying connected and the huge toll isolation can have on someone, it just, I guess it just brought it, it just shined a light on it more than in previous years. So we know that the brain thrives on constant stimulus, challenging and demanding tasks as well. And there's so many ways to do this, right? So education is one of them. Educate yourself on something that interests you. Learn a, learn a language or, or learn a new skill. Play chess, learn how to play chess. Just do a task with that you know, is challenging and demanding. Or another thing is, another simple thing, 
is do a task with your non-dominant hand. So I guess the main thing is to never settle and just do something that's engaging and fun for you. And then of course, the last one is exercise for brain health. So exercise and regular movement is neuroprotective, meaning that it grows and maintains connections within the central nervous system. Think of it like repairing the roads on a highway. It's really important. Otherwise, like now recently, we get a lot of potholes on the roads, right? So it's, it's important to be repairing and maintaining, maintaining those roads. And so how the central nervous system does this is by releasing two chemicals through exercise as well. And so those two are nerve growth factor and brain derived neurotrophic factor, which both function to stimulate the growth and maintenance of the nerve cells of the brain. So exercise is important, but what we have to also consider is that we need that exercise to be demanding and challenging as well. And so I guess that's where, when it's demanding and challenging, that's where we're really able to unlock this brain food or this maintenance food. And so that's why high intensity interval training is, is, really, is really great to implement in an exercise program. And, I, and to, I guess to define high intensity interval training, just simply, it's characterized by short bursts of really intense work, followed by a period of reduced intensity. And so I guess to summarize brain health, I'll touch on something that a neuroscientist by the name of uh, Dr. Lisa Barnett, uh, sorry, Barrett discussed, Lisa Barrett. And that's two things. One is that the brain one thing is that the two most expensive things for the brain is one, to move your body, and two is to learn something new. So they're very expensive energy-wise. And so I guess when something's very expensive energy-wise, it can be unpleasant or uncomfortable to the body. That doesn't mean that it's a, a bad thing for the body. It just means that it's hard. So. I, it's really important to differentiate between the two, right? Bet between it being bad and between it being hard. And so if you want to impose changes within the structure of the, brain, of the brain, that's what we need to do, make it challenging and demanding. So now that we, we understand or I've discussed why the human system has evolved to thrive on movement and exercise, I guess now we need to understand what exactly occurs in a mess and how this becomes related to the central nervous system. So it, it, to understand a mess, it's critical to understand the central nervous system and the nervous system. And so let's break that down. So first of all, by, by definition, right, and I'm sure everyone is aware of this, but by definition, MS is a neurological condition that affects the transmission of nerve signals from the central nerve system to the rest of the body, causing a range of motor, cognitive, and sensory symptoms, which varies. But what does this mean? How does this come about? That's probably something that we're maybe not so aware of, or maybe we are. But I guess the first thing we need to establish, as I mentioned, is the the nervous system. So what, what we know is that the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and the other being the peripheral nervous system, which consists of the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord. And so together, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system make up our nervous system. And so this diagram here does a, is a good il illustration to show that. So I guess another way of putting it is this. So if we consider the nervous system to be an electrical grid, really, the central nervous system 
would be the powerhouse or it would be the big power generator. And then the peripheral nerve system would be the long power cables that connects the power generator to all the homes and surrounding cities and suburbs. Or I guess another way to think of it is think of the CNS, the central nervous system, as a highway. And then think of the peripheral nervous system as the off ramps to that highway. So I guess imagine it however, however is easier for you. But I guess the idea stays the same regardless of the analogy that you use. And that is that the central nervous system is the information processing center. And then the peripheral nervous system is a link to distribute the information. So now that we've established what the nervous system does or how it functions in a way, we can, I guess we can now link that to MS and how it affects this, right? So with MS, the highway becomes jammed. The nerve is no longer able to transmit rapidly and efficiently because of this traffic jam. And the reason that this traffic jam occurs is as a result of, of breakdown of myelin, which wraps around the nerve, which we can see on the right-hand side here. So what myelin allows is a, and I guess the function put simply is, the role and function of myelin is to allow a rapid and efficient transmission of electrical impulses. So without this myelin, these electrical impulses or information are still, are still able to transmit, it just slowed down significantly and hence traffic jams occur if we have the, the highway energy. And so the picture here does a great job of illustrating what I mean by this. So on the left, we can see what occurs when myelin is lost which is what we call demyelination. So the nerve signal is still being transmitted, but if we compare that to a healthy nerve cell on the right-hand side, we can see that the transmission or the information being sent throughout the body is much slower. And so I guess this is what leads to the many uh, motor and sensory symptoms that people with MS experience. It's simply because of this slow transmission of information being sent from the central nerve system, the brain spinal cord, to the rest of our body. So I hope that's provided a bit more clarity and I guess um, given a bit more in-depth understanding of not only what is MS, but also why, why does this occur? And I think this illustration here does a, a really good job of explaining what MS is in a nutshell. So I've heard my voice for too long. So I guess this, this will be a good time to, to break it up. And I guess so we're all on the same page. If there's any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer. Um, but also in the drop down box, let's let's make use of that. Uh, that function as well. And so let's let's all put it out there. How how often do you exercise and what do you do? You know, let's 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 use this space as not only an information and a, a, as a sort of a one way thing, but let's use it as as a community thing where you know you'll be able to to see what maybe other people are doing or or get get gain some inspiration from other people in the chat function as well. So I'll hand it over to Nicola and um yeah, if there's any questions, then yeah, we can answer those now. Hey, thanks, Eric. So we've got a couple of questions coming in as people perhaps um, pop in the question box as Eric suggested what sort of exercise you're you're doing yourself. So um, Michelle's asking, can you give a bit of an idea or can you talk about when to push through and when to stop? Yeah, look, I, I think there's when to when to push through when to stop i think that's it's important to consider especially with 
people with MS. So what I'd consider number one is, I guess, establish what a baseline is for you. So what are, what are your current uh, fitness levels or exercise levels? So the best way to do that is to do some objective testing. So what that will allow us to do is that will allow us to, I guess, gain an understanding that, you know, on a good day, this is what you're able to achieve. So if on a bad day, you know, you're not able or, you you know, or on a bad day, you're very fatigued or whatnot, maybe if this is your level, then maybe it's maybe on a bad day, then it's not so likely that we push too much in that case, because there's things to consider like, like fatigue or, you know, you might, might just not be filling up to it. But I guess the main thing is that you're able to do something and that's always better than nothing. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think that's that's a good answer, Eric. I think sometimes people as well are concerned about um, when they get a bit of heat happening in exercise and it can be a bit of a pseudo exacerbation as well. And um, so people just being being aware of where their tolerance is is there. Um, so we've got a lot of lot of comments coming in. So just so we can keep things rolling, I'll, I'll move through things a bit quickly. But Carolyn just wanted to refer back to the picture with the nerve, and she just wanted to clarify which is healthy. Is it the bumpy one? Yeah, that's right. So I'll go back to the slide now. So the one on the right is the healthy nerve, right? So what what's the difference, right? So it's those bumpy. I guess, uh, nerve, part, what we call the myelin, is those sort of bumpy yellow uh, pictures that we see there. And why that's considered healthy is because what myelin does is that it allows a rapid and efficient transmission of information from the top to the bottom. And so we can see that on the left-hand side, when those bumpy figures are no longer there, that transmission of information, which is the electrical impulse, which we can see there, it's much slower to to do so. So to get from the top to bottom of the picture, it's uh, it takes a lot more lot more time. It's not as efficient as in a normal healthy nerve cell. So to answer your question, the right would be considered a healthy nerve cell. Beautiful. Thank you, Eric. And people have just said, um, you know, Anthea said, I aim for daily. I don't always su succeed, but I try. I walk our dog and do yoga. Jack is saying she doesn't exercise regularly. Melanie's weight program and walking. Jennifer's yoga and Pilates once a week. Um, um, yeah, Ruff, and these are all Ruff great, is, great forms of exercise. Yeah. And movement. Is saying, heat is my biggest barrier to exercise. Any suggestions? I bought a cool invest, but it's very bulky for golf. Anyone have anything better? And yeah, quite a few things. I won't go through them all. But also another good question here as well um, is from Jacqueline. Do I exercise during an exacerbation? Yay or nay? Yeah, that's that's tough. Usually, usually when people are, are having a, a relapse or an exacerbation, they're usually not able to to do much at all. So, in my experience, clients who are having a relapse or having an exacerbation, which which basically is a is is a worsening of current symptoms. What I, usually the client just doesn't have the energy to to get out of bed really. So. I guess to answer your question, if we're able to ha do something very low impact and completely modify and change what you're doing um, when you're when you're not having when you when you don't have a, a relapse or an exacerbation of your symptoms, if we're able to modify and still do something and still promote regular movement, what that will look like, I'm not too sure, depending on uh, your personal circumstances, but you definitely wouldn't be pushing yourself too much during this stage or you wouldn't be doing what you what you'd usually be used to but i guess the main thing is that if you're still able to to promote regular movement if you're still able to do 
to do something that's much better than than doing nothing at all but once again in my experience um, a lot of clients just simply aren't able to to do much at all and they're just a, a period period of time where um, they're, they're not able to come in and exercise but what I do advise is that no problem if you're not able to come in I'll check up on them but also I'll um, advise them that it's it would still be important if you know if they're able to to promote regular movement whether that just be simply changing positions regularly you know standing going for going for a, for a walk in the backyard or just doing some some very low impact tasks at home as well okay that's beautiful Eric thank you there's a few more questions but I think we need to move on and um, I will make sure those questions are addressed um, after the webinar so let's let's carry on thank you for sure thanks Nicola yeah and some of them like for example the heat sensitive sensitivity we'll, we'll touch on so I, I'm sure we'll touch on a few of these as we go along so I guess let's start with the with um, with why who, what, when, why of exercise now, it's the four W's of exercise. And so we talked about why we should exercise the nervous system NMS. So let's rule all that information now and I guess link it to exercise. And so I wanna do this in a very clear and structured manner. So let's go through each of the W's over the next few slides. So I guess the easy one, right, who? Who needs to exercise? And simply put, everyone. So how we execute that is can sometimes be challenging. And that's more so the question, not so much who needs to exercise, but how do we do that for a, a range of um, people with MS? So I guess the main thing or the main message is to do what's possible for you. And sometimes it's important to not, not only focus on the things you can't do, but also focus on your strengths, focus on what you can do and aim to get better and stronger in that, at that. So just quickly, in this research that was presented by Mark and group, it gives us some insight into a few things. It tells us that one, people with more severe MS symptoms are more likely to participate in less exercise and movement, but two, there's also a large majority of people participating in very low or no physical activity. And three, that a large majority of people are neglecting other forms of exercise, such as strengthening and balance work. So I, I guess this highlights why I wanted to break down the four W's of exercise so that together we can understand what exactly needs to be done and how exactly we do that when it comes to exercise. So I guess the next question is, what, what, what type of exercise should we be participating in? And I guess the main thing is that we want to make, make it meaningful and challenging exercise. But one thing is that what meaningful and challenging is, is different for everyone, right? So whether that be to, due to access to equipment, services, um, or and as well, the disability level or someone's mobility um, level as well. So first thing I'd consider, especially if you're just starting out is, is to make it enjoyable for you. Because as we mentioned before, it usually gets done when it's necessary and fun or enjoyable. So for example, if you hate cardio and you can't think of anything worse than cycling on the bike, then maybe a walk outdoors would be great. But then, you also get very fatigued in the legs and it's warm and heat, sens heat sensitivity is an issue with MS. So maybe that's not the best option. So maybe we do some boxing, which would be a great option, great workout, great cardio. And then I guess why not spice things up and add some high intense bursts or fast punches into your boxing routine. So I guess the, the main idea is to make it fun for you something that you, you'll stick to and something that is that will work with your schedule and is achievable for you. So I guess once you've begun to draft in your mind what exactly are your strong points, what are your perhaps your weak points, what you enjoy and what is achievable for you, 
you can start working your way down and add an aerobic activity to that list. Then maybe add some resistance exercises. So maybe you're finding it difficult to extend your arm, right? So maybe some arm strengthening exercises would be a great option. Or maybe you need to continue working and weight bearing and strengthening your leg muscles so that you can continue to, to transfer independently. So I guess to summarize this is to identify those weak and strong points and then work from there. And so the list continues, right? So add some balance exercises if that's an area of concern for you. Or maybe you find yourself sitting for long periods of, of the day. And so maybe some flexibility and position changes in the, in the chair are important for you. So I guess the idea is that regardless of your level of disability or access to equipment or services, exercise is accessible and achievable for all people. It should incorporate these elements here, but most of all, it should be enjoyable and meaningful to you. And of course, what we include in each uh, category will, will range. It'll be different for everyone. So just quickly, here are just some examples of exercises or, or that you can do with a the TheraBand. So TheraBand, it, I'm sure a lot of people maybe have, or if not, what a TheraBand is, it's just an elastic tubing, which just adds resistance to a certain exercise. And so you can do some of these exercises without a TheraBand, or you can have a, have a weight um, as well. Same thing again, just some very general, very general and may or may not apply to, to everyone. Uh, but he, just some very simple body weight exercises that you can do, whether it be um, on a bed um, or using the your surrounding environment, whether it be stairs or a wall or a chair as well. And then once again, balance exercises, which are really important, right, when it comes to to mobility and gait. And once again, just some simple exercises, but I guess the, the key thing with balance is ensuring a safe environment um, to do these certain exercises. But of course, what I'd recommend with, with all of this is just to seek further clarification and maybe even supervision. Um, so that's where, you know, it'll be, it'll be really, imp really important. And I guess the best avenue forward is to maybe seek that advice from an EP or your local therapist as well. So the next question is when should we exercise, right? So how much should you be doing or what is the minimum amount that I can do to gain a benefit? So I, I guess the guidelines are all pretty consistent in what they recommend and the messaging is is consistent and similar, as I just said. So the recommendation is to uh, participate in at least two exercise sessions a week, if not more. But what I would say is that these guidelines are just that, they're just a guide, right? And so the frequency and intensity may vary. So what I'd say is this, look to incorporate a mixture of these elements and set yourself a goal of completing this at least once if you're not currently participating in a, any exercise at all or at another session if you're doing it once a week already. So the, the frequency will vary but generally speaking let's try to aim for two sessions per week. Now how much should you be doing per session? Once again that depends right it depends on the time available to you, what your goals or what the exercises um, you'll be doing during that session, but also what are your fitness levels and, or what are your fatigue levels as well? Some clients are only able to do 30 minutes, others an hour and 15 minutes. It, it, it just varies and it just depends from client to client and the, the main symptom presentation as well. But I guess the RP scale here or the rate of perceived exertion as we call it, is just a very simple effective and accessible uh, scale to use. And I guess the, the reason 
that it's um, so simple and easy to use is that it gives us, um, it helps us to identify the intensity that we're exercising at. So remember that we want it to be challenging and meaningful to invoke change, okay? So there should be a level, level of discomfort and you should be slightly uncomfortable, but you do need to consider your exercise history and your current levels of fitness. And so sometimes it's a process of seeing how sore or how fatigued you feel the next day or two after your session and then maybe modifying it then. But don't be so discouraged by feeling sore or feeling fatigued as well. Because one thing that we should all be assured of is that the body adapts, okay? It will, it will adapt to the demands that you impose on it. So really set a goal, make it challenging and relative to your situation and get those movement snacks in throughout the day. So there's this, there's this saying, right, where, and I'm sure maybe people have heard it, it's, it's called the, and people say that use it or lose it. And I guess where that originated from was actually, and what, what we call the use it or lose it statement is Wolf's Law. And so where this originated from was from a, a person called Julius Wolf. So he was a German anatomist and surgeon in the 19th century. And what Wolf's Law states is this, it's that bone in a healthy animal will adapt to the loads which it is placed in. So if loading on a bone increases, the bone will remodel itself over time and become stronger to resist the original sort of loading imposed on it. And so it will become stronger. And then I guess the, the reverse is, a, is true as well, right? So if loading on a bone decreases, the bone will become weaker due to a lack of stimulus for remodeling to occur. And so that's why people say use it or lose it. And it's true not only for our bones, but it's true for other anatomical and physiological systems for our body, like our nervous system, our muscular system. And so this is clearly shown in the picture here, right? So we discussed why exercise is important for all people, in particular people with MS. But I guess, why, why do you exercise? Set aside all the benefits that I discussed, you know, to your body, to your brain, your health, but just, I guess, delve and think to yourself, why, why do you exercise or, or what will get you to start exercising now? So I think if you're able to find that why for you, then I think that's, I think that's the most important thing. And I think that matters more than anything else that I talked about earlier. It, and that's what I want to help you uncover, right? Finding that why for you. And so just quickly, here's just a quick snapshot of the modifiable lifestyle guide, which was released by MS Research Australia, I believe about two years ago. And it just provides a very easy to follow and clear summary of the exercise guidelines and other lifestyle guidelines as well. So we've established all things exercise and now we're all super keen and motivated to get started or continue to exercise. So for some that provide some, that, that provide some sort of, uh, I guess a guideline or acknowledgement that what they're doing is, is great. For others, it maybe raises more questions or maybe you're ready to start your exercise journey, but would maybe appreciate or benefit from more support. So what I'd recommend is seeking guidance from your exercise physiologist with the knowledge of MS and other neurological conditions as well. So get in touch with these services and providers that are avail available to you, right? And so if you don't know where to start, MS Connect is, is a great starting place. And you know, who knows, I might even be working with you directly later down the track. But really the message um, is simple, to make it fun, identify your strengths and your weaknesses, stay active and keep 
getting in those movement snacks throughout the day. And if you're able to hit those points, then I guess that will set you up well and it, it will set a good foundation on what you should be doing. So once again, I'll have a break there um, or I'm happy to continue as well, Nicola. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, a couple of, couple of really good points coming in, Eric. And also just a reminder that we're just about out of time. So we'll need to um, be quite concise over the next few slides. But I do want to um, make a comment here that Michelle has made. She's asked, how valuable is being just generally active, hanging, washing on the line, walking up and down the stairs, being a mother, working? What benefits does this have? And is it considered exercise? And I, I'm thinking that these do form part of your exercise snacks, Eric, and that it is part of your daily exercise. Yeah, yeah. So to break that down, so to, to answer that, how important is it? Very important. So and why that's important is because what I've discussed uh, initially at the start of the presentation, it's not just it's not just about exercise. I was I was mentioning exercise and movement, and so all those daily daily tasks that you're talking about fall under the movement category, right? Physical activity, and so what I've been promoting throughout this presentation isn't just doing exercise, which is I guess more structured in a way than um, maybe those daily chores, home chores that we all do, but it does fall into that category of physical activity and it does fall into those frequent movement snacks that are really important. So I guess to answer your question that that is really important to do and to continue to doing and it is very beneficial for the human body, which we talked about earlier why that is. Beautiful. Thanks, Eric. And then just a comment and a tip here from Yvette, which I think is really great. Um, she says, I find attaching exercise with a daily activity can help. I sit and stand as I sit at the table, weights or walk during the ads on the telly. I do balance exercises as I come to the kitchen bench, which that's a really great tip, isn't it, Eric? I love it. I love that. Yeah, I love that, that you know, where people are, uh, you know, giving that advice to others but also yeah that's right it's it, it 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 sometimes it's about being efficient and we can incorporate this into our daily activities and it doesn't have to be so complex or it doesn't have to be a big big obstacle or a hassle so yeah really really great to to see and hear beautiful thanks eric so i think we can um, extend the webinar for about five more minutes, but we'll need to bring it to a close after that. So I know Eric's got some other really great information for you, so we'll push on, but we'll just be five minutes over. Thanks, Eric. Yes, sure. And look, these ones, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll run through quite quickly because I'm sure we're, we're all aware of, of some of the barriers to exercise, right? And so, I guess the next next logical question is why? Why, despite all the research and information, we continue to see low activity levels? And that comes down to some of the barriers that we all face, but also some of the common MS symptoms as well. So just quickly, motivation is one of them, right? Motivation is transitory though. And so there'll be periods where with motivation, you'll be really motivated to, 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 to do something, but then other times you're not so much. So maybe not using motivation as your main source as to why you exercise would be good because motivation is goes up and down and it's transitory, right? Um, other thing, goal setting, very easy and effective way to persevere forward as well. So other thing is uh, access to support and access to the right services. And so that's where we as EPs come in. So what I'd recommend, is, as I said before, is to get in touch and seek those supports and services that are available to you. And so I guess one last thing is is having a sort of a team catch team captain analogy. And I think that's really important when dealing with a complex neuro condition. And so it's important to have a multidisciplinary approach, right? So having your OT, EP, physio, psychologist, dietitian, and whatnot, and they're all able to provide valuable in input. But within this T 
team, there should also be a, a, a team captain. And I guess that's where you, the client, should be, should come in and that's your role, right? And so I guess when you're in charge, then, and you steer the ship and you pick the team, if you have this mindset, then you're more, more likely to be engaged and stay informed and be held accountable. So just quickly, heat sensitivity as well. We know that um, it's a common symptom, right? And so I guess what heat, sensi heat sensitivity does in essence is, is just, it leads to a, a temporary worsening of symptoms as we discussed earlier. The reason being is that as we discussed, the signals from traveling from the brain to the rest of the body are slowed down. And then this is exacerbated more with heat sensitivity. So think of it as a worsening of a bottleneck in a, on a highway. The good news is though that heat sensitivity is temporary and does not cause a, a permanent worsening of symptoms. And in my experience with the exercise NMS, it can be very well managed as well. So just some very simple, effective and easy strategies that we can implement to mitigate the impact of heat sensitivity. So fatigue, once again, we know um, a very common symptom of MS and something that's often misunderstood as well. Um, it, it's, it's difficult because it's not something that we're able to see. And so I guess the best way to describe it is that, or best way that clients describe it is that they just, it's just so overwhelming that they struggle to function or feeling like the energy has just been drained completely from them. So although the exact mechanism is not understood, the, the best way to, to, to think about it is, think of it like instead of a message going from point A to point B, that message from point A now has to go through a maze to reach point B. And so if you think about it, a detour on a road, right, where you're not able to go because the road's closed, you have to go all the way around, right? And so what that means is that we have to travel more and then expend more fuel. And so this is, in essence, is what causes MS fatigue, or what's theorized to cause MS fatigue. So how can I manage my fatigue? Two main things, maximizing that energy through these uh, factors, and then using that maximized energy efficiently, okay? So it's all about budgeting in a way. So same, same thing, same principle applies here with exercise and fatigue management. It all, and it all, in essence, comes down to modifying the program. Once again, as we discussed already, uh, reduced mobility definitely is a, uh, a big hindrance to people participating in regular physical activity, but hopefully we now understand that there are things that we can do and there are services that we can reach. And so promise just to wrap up now, barriers to exercise. Five top things is education engagement. Education is powerful and it, I guess it gives, um, I guess the fact that you're all watching this just is testament to your ticking that first one. Two, motivation is transitory. So maybe consider something that you won't be discouraged or that won't fluctuate from day to day. Goal setting is important. Consistency is key. And then last thing, keep it simple, but I should also should have added, keep it fun as well. So don't over, don't over over complicate things. Just keep it simple, fun, and engaging. Right. Uh, once again, healthy lifestyle guide. Here's the link, um, and I highly recommend that everyone uh, downloads this. Once again, seek assistance from your local EP. And I guess just to summarise, I guess the core elements of the presentation today is something I hope you all took away from it is that. As humans, we evolved for regular movement and exercise. So we should aim to keep having those movement snacks throughout the day and aim to exercise twice a week, if not more, right? What that looks like will be different for everyone, but if you're able to identify your strengths and weak points, it will provide a good base to set up an exercise routine for yourself. And so if evolution's taught us anything, it's that as humans, we move and exercise when it's necessary, and when it's fun. So let's let's think of ways that you, you can incorporate that into your exercise routine. And so just finally, to wrap things up, 
I'll leave you with these three statements here, but I'd also like to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, apologize for going over time, but I hope I was able to provide some insight and I guess see exercise and movement from a different perspective, from an evolutionary perspective. But I guess most importantly, uh, thanks to you guys all listening. Thanks for having me a part of your ongoing journey towards a more fulfilling and healthier lifestyle. So greatly appreciate it and thanks for listening. Eric, thank you so much. You've really challenged how we think about exercise and how we've evolved as human beings. And I think the clients that get to work with you in Lidcom are very fortunate, Eric. You've been, I struggle to exercise and I think you've really inspired even me to get moving. So, so that's great. So thanks heaps for your time, Eric. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Nicola. So I just want to uh, finish up with a couple of housekeeping slides just to remind you that there are um, many services available for you that we can help you with. We've got NDIS support. We've got our wonderful MS Connect service that you can call and speak to a nurse advisor, to a social worker, to an MS expert. We've got employment support, the wonderful well-being and peer support service etc so reach out we're here to to help you we've got some um, great interviews with experts on our podcast series so i really encourage you to subscribe to that and, and have a listen there's some really uh, really wonderful uh, podcasts and episodes there for you obviously the webinar library the range of uh, webinars on just about every subject you can can imagine so please get in touch if we can help you in any way. The gateway to our services is MS Connect 1800 042 138. Thank you so much for your company today. Any questions we didn't get to answer directly, we will follow up with and look forward to the next webinars we share with you. Take care. Bye for now. Bye, Eric, and big thank you. Thank you.